Who comes out on top in the Battle of Crimson? You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? Welcome to a very special Locked On crossover edition of Locked On Sooners and Locked On Bama. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get in on the action over at FanDuel by placing your first $5 bet. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets. If you win your first $5 bet, visit FanDuel.com today. We got Jimmy Stein. We got Luke Robinson of Locked On Bama. I'm John Williams, and this is Jay Smith, Locked On Sooners, and we're going to get everything ready for you for this week's massive showdown. Well, at least a year ago, it looked like it was going to be a massive showdown between the Oklahoma Sooners and the Alabama Crimson Tide. And guys, I want to start with this because when the schedule was announced a year ago, I think everybody in Sooner Nation was pumped because we were going to get to see Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide coming to Norman. And then Nick Saban retired. So just, you guys can both answer this question. The first year of Kalen DeBoer, where are Bama fans at right now after the season that they've had so far? That's a good question. Uh, obviously, it's changed, you know, week to week. You know, that Vandy loss wasn't wasn't a great uh, week for, for the new regime. Uh, but overall, I've been actually surprised and a little impressed by the embrace of DeBoer. I think it was easy to look to the future and think, gosh, when Nick Saban retires, this is going to be a mess. And and who knows how it may play out as we go forward. But there's been uh, almost surprising embrace because Kalen DeBoer has changed so much. It's a new offense. It's a new defense. He's, his personality is radically different than, than Nick Saban, how his relationship with the players is even a little different. So much change after so much success. You would expect there to be a – a pushback, but really there hasn't been. There's been more of an embrace, and the results, uh, while a little uneven, it hasn't been great. This I wouldn't call this vintage Nick Saban Alabama, but overall, personally, I, I'm kind of surprised and impressed by how Kalen DeBoer's been accepted by Alabama fans. Yeah, I think that's right, and one thing that has certainly helped is the expanded playoff because had Alabama lost to Vanderbilt in the old system, we'd already be out. And people would, you know, be ready to run him out of town on a rail. Now, that's probably exaggerating. But at the same time, he does have the number two recruiting class in the country. That's helping a lot. Pete, there was some concern about recruiting in state, but I think that's going to come. And, you know, Alabama's, when you're number two in the country, it's hard to complain. Oh, well, you're not getting in state guys. Well, I mean, we're getting the best from everywhere. So, I think that, you know, beating Georgia certainly helped. Demolishing LSU certainly helped. Um, the Vanderbilt loss is more understandable now that Vanderbilt isn't Vanderbilt that we know. And the Tennessee loss, I mean, I think, in my opinion, I think clearly Alabama's the better team. They just had kind of an off day and an off everything. And it was also Kalen DeBoer's first true SEC road test. They went to Vanderbilt and lost, but that was 80% Bama fans there. So I think he's. we got to remember he's on a bit of a learning curve too, even though he's been one of the better coaches in college football the last few years. The one thing I've noticed with Bama and watching a lot of the games is that the offense is still as potent as it was when Lane Kiffin first walked in the door. <laughs> Same thing with Sarkeesian, right? As we've gone down, it saw a little bit of a dip with Bill O'Brien and Tommy Reese, but not that much, but it's gone back up. Defense-wise, though, this is what fascinated me. Defense is still pretty solid for the most part. It uh first half is always typically really, really good. Second half, things have been questionable. How do you feel about DeBoer's staff around him, especially on the defensive side, the performance that they've shown coming into this first year? Yeah, there's kind of been a September defense and an October defense. I mean, moving, I mean, the the initial start wasn't that great. You gotta remember Nick Saban, it was Nick Saban's defense for 17 years. So it was really embedded. Yeah, sure, there's some new starters from the portal, some freshmen some younger guys, but for the most part, Alabama played defense one way for 17 years. So it's a huge change schematically, terminology. I think in retrospect, we should have uh, expected more of a rough start 
than we did. So it was a little surprised when Alabama gave up that second half to Georgia and gave up 40 points to Vanderbilt and Nashville. Uh, maybe that should have been somewhat more expected in terms of the rough start. But, hey, they, they seem to be comfortable with it now. Alabama's played very well defensively the last three or four weeks. And I know Oklahoma fans know what that looks like because – because uh, Oklahoma has been really good on defense lately, uh, you know, so Alabama's really, I think, developed a comfort level with the new scheme. Yeah, and the defensive backfield had to grow up some. A lot of youngsters playing back there. I mean, you got to remember Alabama lost what a lot of people thought was the best safety in the country last year, Caleb Downs to Ohio State. Then they bring in Keon Sab, who was having a fantastic year, a transfer from Michigan, and now he's lost for the season, and they put in a kid named Bray Hubbard who is looking very, very good, but he's, he's inexperienced. Um, but you got guys like uh, Jalen Mbakwe and, and Zabian Brown and Zay Mincy, uh, a lot of youngsters back there playing right now and, and some other transfers. Uh, Deshaun Jones, for instance, Damani Jackson. Um, these guys are playing well, but it's taken a while for them to gel. And uh, boy, I thought they played super against an LSU team that is known for slinging the ball all over the field. Uh, the last game against Florida for LSU, notwithstanding, because frankly, I think Alabama beat LSU twice. Uh, it was so being humiliated in Baton Rouge that you go to Gainesville against a team that is desperate for a win and they get embarrassed. LSU may be mailing it in the rest of the season. Hey, fortunate for Oklahoma. Yeah, that, you know that Vanderbilt loss was, I think, surprising to everybody. But I think the the Tennessee one kind of. It, like you said, they might have been walking, like sleepwalking through that game. Did a, did a flip get switched after that one? Because since then, Alabama has just been absolutely dominant. I like how a flip gets switched. I thought it was a switch gets flipped, but I like what you say better. I'm going to go that. with that. Let's go with that forward. I think it was really – this is a bizarre take on this, but there was a, a goal line stand to preserve uh, a shutout against Missouri. And where Alabama had put in uh, the backups, the, the garbage time guys, and Missouri drives down the field, and they get inside the five yard line, and they're going to score. Times elapsing, and it doesn't matter. It's thirty to nothing, and there's a minute or so left. Alabama starters begged to go back in the game to preserve the shutout, and and Kalen DeBoer let the starters back in for one play on the goal line to keep Missouri out of the end zone, and they did. I don't know, but if, if there was a switch that was flipped, to me it was that moment. The defense has been very intense since then, and it, it's been a different, almost a shutdown defense since, since that time. So if I'm going to point to one thing, to me it was more that, but there's no doubt you leave Tennessee with that second loss. We know what the expectations are in Tuscaloosa. It's making the postseason. Uh, I also think that there's been a ramp up in intensity since they've obviously had their back against the wall following the trip to Knoxville. Yeah, they've definitely uh, – the, the defense got has gotten better. I think they realized they had to get better. Um, I think it's also coincided with the offense finding a little bit more of itself. I wouldn't say that they're a fully formed identity just yet, but they're getting there a little better. And, it, look, there was going to be a learning curve, as I said earlier. Um, this – you know, what kind of Jalen – what kind of quarterback do you want Jalen Milrow to be? And I think they're figuring it out more and more and more as, as the games go on. You said a great time. You know, obviously, it's, uh, you know, when I looked at the schedule at the beginning of the year, I thought this was going to be one of the rougher stretches for Alabama. I know Alabama is a big favorite. It's, I'm not sure which Oklahoma is going to show up. I feel like I know, um, but I'm not sure. I mean, they could be treating this like, hey, this is kind of our Super Bowl thing, and, and I wouldn't blame them. Um, and then we played – the Iron Bowl against Auburn, and that's always tough, even though Alabama seems to handle Auburn pretty well in Tuscaloosa. They hate our guts. We hate their guts. And, uh, you know, just one other thing, I was just perusing the recruiting rankings because apparently Florida State just lost another commitment to who flipped to Florida. And I was thinking about how, you know, God, how far they've fallen. And, and then I looked at the recruiting rankings and saw uh, Oklahoma, or at least on the own three rankings, listed at number 12. And this is what this is what Alabama fans and SEC fans have been saying over the years. Whereas, you know, and this is not a shot at Oklahoma. Some Oklahoma people may have been like, oh, y'all just overrate the SEC every year. Oklahoma's number 12 in the country in recruiting. But in the SEC, they've got Texas A&M, Tennessee, Auburn, Texas, LSU, Georgia, and Bama ahead of them. I mean, you're, you're num if you're number 
seven or eight in the conference, but number 12 in the country, that tells you how good this conference is. And I think Oklahoma's had a bit of an awakening to that. And I have no problem saying this. Y'all got completely hosed with the schedule. Texas got an absolute candy yeah. land of a schedule with no uh, – you know, gumdrop tar babies or whatever they did, whatever they have that you fall into. I can't remember how you play that game. You fall into some kind of tar pit, right? But uh, right. you, you uh, and but they have none of that. It's just nothing but candy all the way to the top. You know, um, it, so yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I, I think you guys got absolutely jobbed on the schedule. I'm I I would have complained. If I were y'all, I don't know if it would have done any good. To, to no avail. On the mountaintop complaining about it. I mean, yeah. our, our stance has always been, we're Oklahoma. This is the SEC. If you're Oklahoma, you don't run away from a challenge or complain about a challenge. But we did talk about how difficult the schedule was in relation to Texas. And it's proven to be as difficult as we expected it to be, just exacerbated by the fact that Oklahoma has been obliterated by injuries on the offensive side of the ball. I'm glad Luke has an idea about which Oklahoma team's going to show up this Saturday because I don't have an idea. <laughs> Let's discuss that coming up next here on Locked On Sooners and Locked On Bama. Today's episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. I love a great deal. That's why several years ago, I switched over to Mint Mobile myself. Got recommended by my brother-in-law and his wife. They'd been on it for years. We got on it for years, and we've loved it. Now my father and mother-in-law are on Mint Mobile as well. And it's easy to get started. There's no hoops, no BS. So when Mint Mobile said it, it's easy to get a wireless plan for $15 a month with the purchase of a three-month plan, it really is that easy. The longest part of the process is the time it takes on hold waiting to break up with your old provider. You can get unlimited data, unlimited talk and text with Mint Mobile. To get started, go to mintmobile.com slash locked on college. There you'll see that right now, all three month plans are only $15 a month, including the unlimited plan. All the plans come with high speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with your existing contacts. Find out how easy it is to switch to Mint Mobile and get three months of premium wireless service for 15 bucks a month to get this new customer offer and your new three month premium wireless plan for just $15 a month. Go to mintmobile.com slash locked on college. That's mintmobile.com slash locked on college. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash locked on college, $45 upfront payment required new customers on the first three month plan only speeds slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan additional taxes fees and restrictions apply see mint mobile for details again we got locked on bamas jimmy stein and luke robinson jay smith myself from locked on sooners so guys the oklahoma sooners are probably not the oklahoma sooners you expected coming into the season right because offensive, uh, I, I, it's not the Oklahoma Sooners y'all expected to see, and y'all know the depth chart. Y'all know y'all know the lineup as well as any Oklahoma guys out there, and it's not the lineup y'all expected to see. Jay was telling me before before we we're off the air, this is something like y'all's tenth different iteration on the offensive line. You're down at some point this season. I know five wide receivers that y'all expected to play. Uh, I'm and boy, and then of course switching out the quarterbacks. Uh, what what a mess, but not of your own making. It just from from afar, it looks like a mulligan to me. Like you just can't compete with that level of uh, of injury situation. Yeah, we're walking in like uh, we have a large uh, CVS receipt of injuries, right? As everybody knows, those things are ginormously long, and we just got lucky this year. It literally is a situation where bad luck meets. The schedule we talked about in the last uh, session, I was uh, in the last um, uh, segment. I was talking to a buddy of mine about that when we came into the season because the biggest question around Oklahoma was at offensive line. A lot of we lost two guys, we lost three guys, four guys to the draft, and we lost four guys to the portal, which were more your older players. So we were playing a lot of younger guys. So we portaled in some new ones, and he was telling me he was like, "Man, I'm I have questions around your line. Can Bill Beaton both figure this out?" And I was like, "Well." I expect him to figure it out in, in time, but the only thing that's going to save these young quarterbacks, because we have a true sophomore quarterback who only has like five starts, is going to be that we have wide receivers he can throw to that are veteran, that they'll be able to take some of the pressure away, right? When you have a really good wide receiver room and a mediocre quarterback, 
the wide receivers somehow catch random passes that are thrown in their direction no matter what at college. That's just the game. Well, we didn't get that either. So, <laughs> so when you get all the wide receivers gone, when you get the entire offensive line, basically like I said, this week will be our 10th iteration of the offensive line in 11 games. And we've gone through four centers. We've gone through roughly three to four tackles. Uh, left guard, I think, has seen like four or five different configurations. Only consistent piece has been the right guard in Fabichi Weiwu. He's a transfer from North Texas. And he's had his ups and downs, but he's literally the only one that's played every game this season. So it's going to be fun to see which version of Oklahoma shows up this weekend. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny, though. Oklahoma does have a pretty solid win on their resume over Tulane. And what well, seems a little funky to say, but Tulane may end up being uh, the representative <laughs> from the group of five in this. Now, I, I know you'll throw your head, but they're not awful. And you beat no, them 34 not. to 19. It wasn't like you just barely did it. But your, your injury luck is certainly kind of crazy. You hope it never happens again. And the problem with once an injury, a big injury happens, it seems like it starts to snowball sometimes because you do move pieces around who aren't used to being in those particular positions, and then maybe they get hurt, and, boy, next thing you know, it is a domino effect like you can't believe. You're, 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 you're playing guys who aren't ready to play. Just because yeah. they're on the team doesn't mean they're ready to play. I mean, it's college. It's a developmental sport. It's a developmental age. You're you're playing guys that are a year or two away from being ready. It's just uh, – and it just kind of multiplies from there. And I really we're thought – to see some guys that are actually developing. You know, they, they've played Logan Howland and Heath Ozida at left tackle, left guard the last few weeks, and it was a rough go of it against Ole Miss, against a really, really, really good Ole Miss defensive front – and people were ready to, to throw the left tackle in the boat and cast him off the sea. But then he got he's gotten better. He got better against Maine. He was better against Missouri. And he's continuing to develop. It's just these pieces weren't expected to be a part of the, the equation for 2024. But yet here we are. We're relying on them. And they're getting, they're getting better little by little. Now it's going to be fun to see how they continue to develop against Alabama. Boy, I, I, really, I have no problem saying this. Jackson Arnold, I thought he was going to be a – problem for everybody now he may eventually be and uh, you don't want to just give up on him he's still young but i'm saying i expected so much more because you know oklahoma's earned that reputation to just putting quarterback after quarterback in the league put winning heisman trophy winners and um but it just it just hadn't come to fruition now part of that is because you're missing a lot of your wide receivers you're missing a lot of offensive linemen and, and so that sort of throws off everything i suspect Assuming he's still there next year and assuming that he wins the job, that we'll see a much better version of Jackson Arnold next year. Yeah, I agree with that. And that was the one thing that we kind of learned about him and a little bit about the true freshman, Michael Hawkins, is that they, they're they not guys that when everything falls apart, they'll just figure it out on their own. It it feels like they have a little bit of PTSD because with the line, with the with the way things had to shift and situations where you got to play an injured guy because somebody else gets injured a little bit worse, that – you'll see a free rusher come at you and boom, you immediately cower down. And that's no shade to them. It's more so it's a learning experience. This game moves fast, especially as you get further into the SEC. You're going to get some of the top players and the guys that will most likely end up in the league. So that's getting you to that top 1% of the top 1%. So for them, it's now the adjustment period of you've gone through this multiple times. You get an understanding that sometimes you're going to see ghosts and sometimes they are ghosts. And so don't look at them as they're real people. So look at them as ghosts and keep staying focused and throw it. Um, and hopefully that, that's the thing we see with Jackson Arnold. Because you're right. I, I We all thought that he was going to be just keep the party going. But when you have that many circumstances pile up on top of each other, no quarterback is willing to – no quarterback can typically survive it unless they're just like a gamer gamer. Like I got to kind of give it to DJ Lackway over there at you know Florida. Things weren't – they were looking like they were just letting people walk by. Uh, in the offensive line at one point, and he figured out how to get it, and things got comfortable. But to John's point, I think that's the one thing I appreciate about the offensive line is week over week, they're showing, they're showing better. Then an injury happens, but then week over week, they get a little bit better. So hopefully the health and the experience of getting beat up the last 10 weeks will show up this week, and we can able to keep this game nice and close because the big question now is, whew, uh, if the offense can just keep the ball long enough, what can our defense really do against Jalen Milrow? Yeah, and we got to talk about that. But, I, you know, when you said – talked about Florida, it made me think, I think the SEC missed so many golden opportunities in scheduling this year 
Oh yeah. Uh, number one, not, and I've said this over and over again, Auburn not playing Ole Miss is bananas to me. The, the Hugh freeze lane Kiffin dynamic, uh, um, all that Perfect. stuff. And they're going head to head for some guys in Mississippi right now, recruiting wise. I think that is such a natural, I mean, no matter how bad Auburn is this year, or, you know, if, if Ole Miss had been doing poorly, that game would have been must watch. I think Oklahoma, Florida, you know, with the fact that y'all played national championships against one another. And if you look, this is hindsight, but it, you guys are in a very similar situation. Like both coaches are sort of fighting to win back the fan bases. Billy Napier's like, sort of taking the lead on that, I would say, right now. But, boy, wouldn't it be interesting if y'all had even two true freshman quarterbacks going at it against one another to try and win your fan bases over? Um, and I also said Alabama and Mississippi State just for geography. Y'all may yeah. not know this. Those are the two closest SEC schools to one another. And we we played them just about more than anybody. So yeah, I don't understand. Well, yeah, y'all have a hundred stink. and what, 12-game streak or something like that of playing with each other? Something yeah, yeah. That ridiculous number? We've played Mississippi State more than we've played any other team, including Auburn right. and Tennessee. You know? It's stupid not to do that. And I know that you're saying, well, you won't just want an easy win. But it's at the same time, it's like it's such a great, easy trip to go to. You know how hard it is to get to Texas A&M? you got to want to get you got to have a blimp. And, and you got to go to College Station. I mean, yeah. even once you get there, it's it's rough going. I, I felt the same thing about Oklahoma, Arkansas. Like, I'm actually closer to Fayetteville yeah. than I am to Norman. So, yeah. that, that would have been a, a natural one. But it's a natural rival. Yes. Yeah, eventually we'll get all these, and it's and it's going to be hard to to get all of these SEC yes. games in. But and, and sorry for uh, you know disrupting the party. Uh, in the SEC with Oklahoma <laughs> and Texas coming in. Uh, no, so many, I, I, so many I, natural I, rivalries getting kind of tossed aside for a couple of years. Well, I think it's we'll great. Dig it. We'll dig it. It's made it's it unquestionably. It's a lot of fun. I mean, we're getting this week. It, it's unquestionably it's the best years. conference. Yeah, it's been 21 years since we've gotten Oklahoma, Alabama in a regular season game. And, wow. you know, and we get Alabama in Norman in a game that matters a ton as they try to maintain their college football playoff lives uh, here down the stretch. How's this game going to go? What does Oklahoma's defense got to do? How can Alabama's offense overcome Oklahoma's defense? Let's discuss coming up next. I'm a gift giver. I don't know about you all, but I love giving gifts. But one of those things I do struggle with is finding the right gift. And everybody's different. Everybody has different ideas. And for me, I want to make sure I'm providing a gift that really lights them up and gets them excited, especially around the holidays. Well, we've got the perfect gift for you. Skylight Frame is a touchscreen digital frame, uh, photo frame your whole family will love. Upload thousands of photos from your phone and watch them appear in seconds. It's so easy to do. Sets up in less than like 60 seconds and it's seamless in sharing. You can invite family and friends to easily share photos via the free Skylight mobile app or email. No camp or subscription required so all the pictures that you take during the family gatherings you can send it all to the same space and everybody can enjoy them especially if you're doing it for like an older family member grandparent aunt uncle they can see all the latest pictures together and it's a touch screen so it's really awesome to be able to take care of satisfaction is guaranteed they're very confident that you will love skylight we offer free 120 day return so and now is a special time limited time offer for our listeners get $20 off your purchase of skylight frame when you go to skylightframe.com forward slash college that is s-k-y-l-i-g-h-t-f-r-a-m-e.com slash college get $20 off your purchase now at skylineframe.com forward slash college and NFL fans, get ready to tackle the season at FanDuel America's number one sports book because right now new customers if you bet $5 you'll get $150 in bonus bets if you win and right now there's a lot of great spreads for you to look at we're talking oklahoma alabama and alabama is a 13 and a half point favorites right now so the line is moving around so if you want to jump in on the action FanDuel app gives you everything you need to place live bets on college as well as nfl all in one place so if you get a hunch in the middle of the game and you want to try your luck feel free to check it out just visit fanduel.com to join today you'll start with 150 dollars in bonus bets if you win your first five dollar bet but you gotta win it's fanduel.com never waste a hunch and make every moment more with fanduel an american an official sportsbook partner of the nfl Again, thanks for making Locked On Bama and Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, as you look at this game from Alabama's perspective, what is going to be a key for them? And, and how do you feel like Kalen DeBoer is going to look to attack Oklahoma's defense? Well, 
Jalen Milrow uh, with his legs has been, I would say, the bread and butter of this Alabama offense when they needed something to happen. Uh, they, they Alabama runs a lot of RPOs. Jalen keeps them a lot. Uh, I would say it's been Alabama's most dependable, best play. And if Alabama can't run the ball with Jalen Milrow, the offense looks a little different. I think it's that's the battle in this game is – can Alabama have some success on the ground, primarily with the quarterback? Can Oklahoma and their really fine defense shut it down? And if they do, force Milrow to either beat you with his arm or maybe one of the other, uh, maybe one of the Alabama backs. I, I think that to me is going to decide this game. Can Jalen Milrow have some success on the ground? He doesn't have to rush for 100 yards, but he's got to make Oklahoma respect and, and worry about his legs, that opens up a lot of other stuff for Alabama. Yeah, I've been saying all along, I think that, um, you know, Milrow's at his best when a play breaks down a little more and then he takes off versus the design runs. Um, he had some some great success against LSU with the design runs. I would attribute some of that to LSU's defense in that great and um, the weather. Uh, but regardless, I, I think that that's – Jalen Miro is starting to find himself. I mean, he's starting to play a lot better. You know, is he going to win the Heisman Trophy? I don't think so. But he's he's playing a lot better. And um, Alabama now has – you know, they played at Tennessee, which was an incredibly raucous environment. Uh, they struggled somewhat. They made some adjustments, played at LSU, which was a raucous environment for about a half. And uh, they made some adjustments, did very well. So now they're going to Oklahoma. And I think one of the things that's going to affect – my actual score prediction for this game is what kind of crowd do y'all think is going to show up? Well, the good thing for us is, is that it's a night game. So we'll probably have a really good crowd. It's still Bama. It's still the SEC. So the expectation is fans, even though we're bad at five and five, they're probably still going to show up just because they want to see, say that they've seen Bama in person. Cause as John mentioned it, a lot of people bought their season tickets and bought tickets going into this in preparation of hopefully seeing Nick Saban in one of his final seasons in college football. They're not going to get that, but at the same time, it's still Bama. We're still both wearing crimson. It's still the numbers on the helmet for Bama. It's still old school football and everybody's still curious to see, okay, will this Bama team, uh, go make it into the playoffs or make an SEC championship game, make it to the playoffs or how deep they'll go while at the same time, how does Oklahoma actually measure up against Alabama? Like as mentioned, our defense has been solid this year. I think we're number two in the country in defensive rush efficiency uh, tops in the SEC. We're one of the better rushing defenses. And honestly, as you, as Jimmy mentioned, that is the bread and butter is, is getting Milrow, not only him running it, but running the ball in general, and so a lot of fans, what I've seen in those that have a positive outlook on this is that we want to see if the defense really is good. Can it slow down Jalen Milrow from running all over the place? If that does happen, and this game is a lot closer than expected, Sooner fans, I believe, will have way more hope going into next season as to what Oklahoma can do. You know, I'm looking at the schedule for Oklahoma right now, and I mean, forget the first three games, but I uh, look at uh, say Tennessee, Auburn, Texas, South Carolina, Ole Miss, all that. Um, the one thing that jumps out in my mind, and I'm not going to go back and look through every game, but I can think of at least one defensive touchdown against Auburn and one defensive touchdown against Missouri. And if you remove those, boy, let's take those out for a second. I know it's all part of the, the grand mm -hmm. tapestry, but uh, – Oklahoma would have only had 20, 15 points against Tennessee, 20 points against Auburn, three points against Texas, nine points against South Kakalaki, 14 against Ole Miss, and only uh, 16 against Missouri. That's what is scary to me. The defense can be as good as it wants to be, but your offense is going to have to put up some points. And that's what it comes down to. And, and I think Oklahoma's got to go into this one with a similar game plan like Vanderbilt. Try to run the ball as much as you possibly can and control the clock. If you get into a situation where you're down 10 points and you're in the second half, that's not going to bode well for Oklahoma and their offensive line and for Jackson Arnold and the passing game. Because when Oklahoma has been put in obvious passing situations, it's not boded well for them. So they're going to have to really lean on the run game. And even if they're down 10 points, continue to lean on the run game because that's been the most productive part of their offense over the last month or so. So continue to lean into it, lean into the quarterback run game with Jackson Arnold, 
lean on your true freshman running backs, Xavier Robinson and Taylor Tatum, who have been productive parts of the offense and, and just try to keep this thing close offensively. See if your defense or your special teams can help you out uh, against Missouri. I mean, they were up nine, three at half against Old Miss. They were up 14 to 10 at half. And then in the second half, those defenses made some adjustments to slow down Oklahoma's offense. And there we were. So lean into the run game. Don't ask Jackson Arnold to do too much against an Alabama defense. that's going to be looking to tee off whenever he drops back to pass. Yeah. For us, that's going to be the most important thing. It's we need to show up in the second half and that's nothing against Alabama whatsoever. It's if we show up in the second half. We can at least make it competitive. That's the most important thing. And it's that, and that run defense needs to be able to do that. But the one thing that if, if we have to take a blueprint, we're going to have to take the Vanderbilt blueprint. The best defense is keeping Jalen Miro off the field. The longer he's off the field, the better off we can be. But the question is going to be is, can we just keep moving the ball enough to get first downs and staying consistent? That was actually one thing I looked at last week when Texas played against Arkansas. That was the way that they were able to close that out. They got a they got a turnover, and then the last six minutes and 55 seconds of the game, Texas had the ball. They didn't try to go score a touchdown. They went out there, first down, one, two, three, first down, one, two, three, first down. They just kept just chipping away at the clock until it ran out. That's our saving grace. If we can keep Milrow off the field as long as possible and don't let him throw it to that freak Ryan Williams, I think we'll be <laughs> all right. I hate I, I hate and love the fact that y'all have the best wide receiver in the SEC and he's only, what, 17 years old still? I think we're going to keep saying that over and over. Um, it would be nice if we didn't, <laughs> Rumor has it. Comes up. But it would have been nice if we didn't play out twice while he was 17 and 18 years old. That would have been great. But, you know, SEC doesn't like us. Yeah. He'll be 18 in February, and the party will all be over. <laughs> and he can just keep saying he's 17. Uh, I just, he, just say that it's, no, it's no big deal when he's 18. Hey, and look, he's making so much in NIL money, he can keep his driver's license. He can make it say whatever he wants to. <laughs> okay. no, and, and that's going to be a big aspect. I mean, as Oklahoma could be great against Jalen Milrow, contain the run game, but they've been a little bit sloppy in some of the explosives uh, over the last uh, six weeks or so. And, and if Alabama's able to get some explosives with – a guy like Ryan Williams, who is very explosive, that could uh, make this game turn a little bit ugly, turn a little bit poorly. So it's going to be a great game, a great atmosphere. I expect a great crowd from Oklahoma fans that are proud fan base, just like Alabama fans are as well. And regardless of how the season's gone, they're going to want to show up and show out and try to impact the game the best way they can. And that's going to do it for this crossover edition of Locked On Bama and Locked On Sooners here on the Locked On Podcast Network. We look forward to breaking this game down further with you all on our respective channels. Go and subscribe to Locked On Bama. Check out their work all week long as you get ready for Oklahoma and Alabama this Saturday night. Subscribe to Locked On Sooners, also over on YouTube, and we're everywhere you guys get your podcasts free and available on all podcast platforms. But until next time, we got Jimmy Stein, Luke Robinson, Jay Smith. I'm John Williams. We'll talk to you then. Have a great week and enjoy OU Bama.